I think we've got it posted, not yet. And we'll be going into the book of uh, 2 Samuel chapter 9. So if you'd like to go ahead and find your place while you're flipping to 2 Samuel chapter 9. Is there anyone just like to say a word for the Lord before we get started this morning? There's a testimony burning on your heart. You've been, you've been saying to yourself, man, if I ever get back in church, I'm going to tell what good things the Lord's done. And now you're back here and you want to do that. Who wants to do that? Yes, ma'am, go right ahead. Well, well, God bless you. And I knew the minute you and I started talking that this was who God wanted me. Well, I'm so glad to have you. The last 18 months, I have been very, very blessed to be able to sit under you as my leader. And we've been blessed to have you here, too. Oh. Not only are we getting married, but he is taking me back into my family. So I'm very doubly blessed. But I'm sad too because I'm going to be leaving this church. We're going to miss you. And for the last 18 months, this church has meant everything. Well, God bless you. Thank you for that. It's been my life. We pray God's speed for you guys as y'all travel and as you make the move. Uh, moving's not an easy thing, and whenever you do it later in your life, I think it multiplies. We're finding out what we're made of. And we're I bet you are. We're make it. God bless you. Brother TJ. Um, I've received a, a message. I haven't heard from my daughter in almost two years. Come on. I mean, just we're safe. Yep. And uh, Debbie got a message on Facebook the other night. Uh, on Friday morning, Amanda's house, she has to do at this halfway house, she has to do this devotional every every morning. And on Friday morning, the name of the devotional was the blame game. <laughs> <laughs> this past Friday? This past Friday. Wow. And she had, she was in a meeting the night that I brought the message and she did not get to see the message until Thursday. <laughs> and then Friday morning, her devotional was the blame game, and she responded back and said, wow, I am not only hearing from my heavenly father, but I'm hearing God bless you, brother. Father. Amen. And I went, I went, thank you, Lord. Amen. I like that. Has anybody ever else ever had where God would um, would would hit you in more than one way Amen. with the very same message? So Amen. that. So that you would know that that wasn't a coincidence. Yeah. Uh, he would. He would. Uh, God's awesome. Time we we talked. Uh, we did a study um, some time ago. It was a small group thing that we did many many years ago. That was called uh, experiencing God, knowing and uh, doing the will of the Lord. And and in that study, I'll never forget one of the things I learned, brother Dave, was uh, that Blackaby said that God always always leads us in these multiple ways. Um, through His Word, through the Spirit, through prayer, um, through others. Uh, he, he mentioned five different ways, and he said God always moves. He confirms Himself that way so that you, you don't have to have any doubt. You know that God's speaking to you. Our problem is that we often don't want to do what He's saying. You know what I'm right. so, um, so it's not about not hearing from God. It's about us be willing to do what God said. Is there anybody else quickly before I get to the message? Miss Thelma. Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-
Yeah. I'm afraid of him first and him because you know me. I'm afraid of him. Under your daddy. Yep. And he told me, he said, You'll like Brother Bo. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Brother TJ. Yeah. I said, and I love a brother, buddy. Yeah. I said, but I've known him a long time. Yeah. Like him anyway. And, and I, <laughs> right? <laughs> but I remember it wasn't five minutes later you come by. Yeah. Buddy, I was starving. That's what you told me. That's what you told me. My soul. Hallelujah. I had run from God for so long. Go ahead, Bob. And God bless you, buddy. So, I, I love y'all. I love Amen. Amen. Amen, brother. Amen. I'll never forget that Sunday. Uh, I, Bobby, I went over to shake Bobby's hand and welcome him, and uh, I said, hey, man, what's going on? He said, feed me. That's exactly what he said, feed me. And that's been, I've been hearing that challenge in my ear ever since he said that, because I know that's what we're called to do. Amen? Amen. And uh, the, the, here's the word. Uh, this is the bread of life. And uh, it's our job to break that. And this morning we're going to 2 Samuel chapter number 9. And you might, they might hear this phrase and think that it's pretty common. Uh, it's a promise is a promise. A promise is a promise. Uh, we'll be taking you to the... Uh, uh, First of all, we'll be looking at 1 Samuel. You don't have to look there if you want. It's only two scriptures. Uh, that's where the promise actually comes in. But as you see listed, uh, we're going to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 20. We'll be doing verses 14 and 15 first. But the message is coming out of 2 Samuel chapter 9. So I, don't, I want to make sure you got your fingers in there. Uh, you may want to take and make a few notes as we go through. We're going to tell you the story about a guy you probably already know about him, a guy named Mephibosheth. And you, I don't ask, I'm, I hope I don't mess that up too many times. Uh, Mephibosheth. Mephib, yeah. I may call him old Meph, but um, Mephibosheth. So I, I'm shooting on that uh, from the hip right there. A promise is a promise. First Samuel chapter 20, verses 14 and 15. Uh, Mephibosheth is not in these verses yet. This is a conversation that takes place between a man named Jonathan and a man that you know named as David. Before David became king, Jonathan's daddy Saul was the king at this time, and Saul hated David, even though he had gave him his daughter to, to marry, and, uh, but uh, a spirit of jealousy had rose up inside of King Saul, and, and he wanted to kill David because he felt like everybody loved David more than they did him. And, and before, before I go any further, just let me tell you something, that jealousy is a green monster that can just kill you, and you, you, need, you need to get rid of any envy or jealousy that may be in your heart today. Um, listen, there's plenty of love to go around. There's plenty, there's plenty of love to go around, and, and there's, there's plenty of room in the family of God. You ain't got to worry that uh, the, somebody might have got their name mentioned and you didn't. I, I promise you that uh, nobody's overlooking you. You're loved. You're cherished. You're missed when you're not here. And this is what was going on between Jonathan, Saul's son, King Saul's son, and David, as Jonathan knew and understood that God had anointed David to be the next king over Israel, and he received that. Jonathan was a godly man, and this is what he said to David. He said, and thou shalt not only while yet I live show me the kindness of the Lord that I die not. He said, when you become king, David, I want you to make sure that you promise me that you will show me kindness while I'm alive and uh, not kill me because I am part of the king's family. Normally when a new king comes in, he kills all the other king's family so that there's no contest for 
before the throne, right? So, uh, so Jonathan is telling David, I, uh, Thou shalt not only while I yet live show me the kindness of the Lord that I die not, but also, verse 15, Thou shalt not cut off thy kindness from my house, from my family members, uh, forever. No, not when the Lord had cut off the enemies of David, every one from the face of the earth. God has given you your position. And so I ask you to not only love me and take care of me, but take care of my, my household, my descendants, my family for, forever because God has blessed you. There's enough room for you to get your blessings from God and for me also to get blessings from God. And so that was the promise. And David made that promise and that covenant with Jonathan that forever he would show the kindness of the Lord to Jonathan and Jonathan's house, his descendants forever. It wasn't too long after that that David did become king. And, um, and, and David's um, rise to the throne as you're beginning to move over to the second Samuel chapter 9 and David's rise to the throne there was much time that was spent in battles and in wars and in getting things established uh, even um, uh, David was having some issues among the, the kingdom and making sure that everybody was following And but after he got through and got established on the throne it had been years and years and years we come to 2 Samuel chapter 9 I'm going to read this chapter so stick with me because it's 13 verses and I, I, I need you just to kind of hang with me so that I can just read through it now David has come to the throne he's established himself and it's kind of like he can take a breath for a minute and think about things and, and sometimes maybe you need to stop and think about where God has brought you from. Maybe it's been, you've been a busy beaver and God has been doing all kind of things in your life so much so that you just kept your, you kept your head down and you kept working, working, working and you didn't realize maybe where you were and you get stopped and you sit down and you take a break and then you remember, I, you know what? I made some promises to God. I made some promises to people in the name of God. And, and David began to think about some things he had done and he remembered Jonathan. And the, and the camaraderie, the, the, the fellowship they had and the promise that was made. In verse number 1, chapter 9, 2 Samuel, David said to his court, Is there any, is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul, any family members of King Saul's, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake, or because of the covenant that I made with his son Jonathan? <laughs> And there was of the house of Saul a servant, one of King Saul's servants, whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. Now I can imagine Ziba's thinking he's being called in to have his head cut off because he was a servant of King Saul. And now David is the king, but that's not what happened. Verse 3, And the king said, is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the, notice this, the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, well, Jonathan hath yet a son which is lame on his feet, he's crippled. And the king said unto him, where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, behold, he is in the house of Machar, the son of Amiel in Lodabar. And the king sent, and King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Machar, the son of Amiel from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the crippled man, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David. That make Mephibosheth a grandson of King Saul. Uh, he come unto David. Notice what he did. He fell down on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered and said, Behold, thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not. Now Mephibosheth has to be thinking that since he's the last surviving family member of Saul's, this is it. He finally called up with me. I'm about to buy the big one. David said, don't be afraid, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul 
thy father, thy grandfather actually, and thou shalt eat bread at my table, the king's table, continually. And he bowed himself. But Phibosheth couldn't believe what he was hearing. He bowed himself and he said, and this isn't just a bow of, of reverence. This is a bow of humility. He can't believe. He's, he's humbled to a degree you can't even imagine. He bows himself down and he says, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, the one that identified Mephibosheth, and he brought him in and he said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son, Mephibosheth, all that pertaineth to Saul and to all of his house. I've given all the possessions that belong to King Saul. I've now assigned them. I have signed title over to Mephibosheth since he is the legal rightful heir to his grandfather's stuff. I've signed it all over to him and, uh, and, 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 and to all his house. Um, and then in verse number 10, Thou therefore and thy sons... And thy servants, he's talking to Ziba, he said, now I want you, you were the servant of King Saul, you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him, because he's crippled, and thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. So that Meph I want you to do all the work on the land that I'm giving to Mephibosheth, and I want you to take care of his household and all of his business and bring in everything so that he can have food to eat in his house. But as for Mephibosheth, thy master's son shall eat bread always at my table, at the king's table. He's going to be here in the palace with me. Now Ziba, Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. <laughs> I'll come back to that. <laughs> then said Ziba, then said Ziba unto the king, according to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. Everything you tell me, I'm going to do it just like you said. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, now don't forget, he's going to eat with me at my table as one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all that dwelled in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. So all of Ziba's family, his sons, um, and all that dwelt with him, they were talking about wives and children and grandchildren, everybody that dwelt in the house of Ziba and his servants were now serving Mephibosheth. Verse number 13, So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table, and was lame on both of his feet. Mephibosheth was crippled. He got dropped when he was five years old, when he was fleeing from the invasion uh, that was coming uh, by, King da by David to take over the kingdom. And he was fleeing, and his nurse picked him up to run with him. She dropped him, and it damaged him so that both of his feet were crippled. And from five years old, he would have been crippled. He hadn't, so he, we find that whenever he's first introduced in this story, that he's living in a place called Lodabar with a, with a generous rich man who has just taken care of him. So he's in a place where he doesn't own anything. He's probably never worked uh, physically, worked for anything because he's been crippled all his life. Had to depend on somebody else to take care of him most of his life. And, he, and he's, he's felt like, you see what he says about himself. He says, I'm like a, a dead dog. He, he had a, such a low self-esteem of who he was. Nobody cared for him. Nobody thought much of him. He's of the, he's of the family of the ex-king. And so, therefore, he's not much thought of anymore. We're in another era now. There's another king, and his king is glorious, and the glory of David is established everywhere, and everybody loves David. So, so uh, all of the descendants of Saul are, are kind of cast into a shadow, uh, and even the memory of them. And so, here Mephibosheth has been staying in this house and receiving charity from somebody and never having anything of his own. And then David says, I need to find out if there's somebody, if there's somebody I can show kindness to so I can keep my promise. 
A promise is a promise. And I made a promise to Jonathan, and I want to keep my promise. And Ziba said, yeah, there's one I know of. He's crippled on both his feet. He said, let's go get him and bring him in. So when he brings him in, he, he, he goes through the story that we just told you about. And he said, look, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you back everything that belonged to your family. You are now the rightful owner of it all. So he went from rags to riches. Amen. He now owns so much. He's going to have to have somebody to help him. So King, King David calls Ziba and says, come here, boy. And Ziba comes in and says, yes, master. And he said, look, I just gave everything that King Saul owned to Mephibosheth. It's legally and rightfully his. Now what I want you to do is just like you served Saul, I want you to serve his grandson, Mephibosheth. So I want you and all of your house to become his servants, to take care of all the fields, the houses, all the possessions, and bring it all into his house. It's not yours, it's his, but I want you to work it. And Ziba said, just like you say, king, that's what I'll do. So now, he said, oh, but by the way, when it comes time to eat, Mephibosheth's going to stay with me. He's going to be sitting at my table. He's going to be here with me. I'm going to take care of him. You're going to take care of his stuff. The reason I bring this to you is because a promise is a promise. It's exactly what God did for me. You're exactly right, brother. Here it is. Let me, let me go through some things real quickly. You might recognize this. I got to move fast because I don't eat up so much of my time. But I, I think you might catch this. And I, God help me. Help me to say everything I need to say and to leave the things that I don't need to say unsaid. Here we go. Number one, the kindness. The kindness that was shown to Mephibosheth was a kindness that was unsought. You never hear about Mephibosheth calling up the palace and saying, is King, is King David there? Hey, King, I happen to be the only living relative, and what you, what, what's in the kingdom belongs to me. You don't hear him asking for it. He's not seeking after it. He, he, he feels like he doesn't deserve it to begin with. He's not worthy of it. And if he had it, what would he do with it? The, the kindness that he received was a kindness that was unsought. Um, he didn't make any application to the king. You know, the world doesn't seek after God. The Bible tells us in the book of Romans that uh, it, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one, and there is none that understandeth, and there is none that seeketh after God. Now, if, if we understood, we know there's a God. All the world knows there's a God. I know some people think they're atheists, but they're not. Uh, there's, everybody knows there's a God. The Bible tells us very clearly in Romans 1, they know. They just reject it. Yeah. Now, let me get back to this message. So everybody knows there's a God, and they know He's magnificent. He's creator of all. He owns everything, but they don't petition Him for anything. The, the, the gracious, magnificently rich, wealthy God of the universe, and we don't ask Him for nothing. We don't even seek after Him. Thank God He seeks after us. He seeks after us. And in fact, the Bible talks about He reached further down than we could reach up, or the songs, I guess we sing. It says that he, His hand reached further down than I could reach up. And the Bible tells us that nobody seeks after Him, but He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to us, not us looking for Him. Uh, so the kindness that we're, that we're shown by God, listen to me for a second, was, you don't have that because you went looking to Him. I was speaking to someone this morning about their family member. They was telling me, well, they're, they're searching now, and they're reading their Bible, and they're talking more about God and stuff. I said, well, I know you know this, but let me remind you, because they're doing that, they're not doing that because of them searching for God. God's drawing them. That's right. Do you know that no man can come to God except the Spirit draw him? If somebody's interested... They have to be drawn of the Spirit. 
And if they ain't drawn to the Spirit, you can preach the finest message and give them a wonderful outline and then an altar call, and they's going to be as dead as a doornail. They ain't going to understand. They're not going to get it. They're not going to comprehend it. They can't receive it because these things are spiritually dis discerned. And so uh, the kindness uh, that, that we received from God was God reaching out to us, not us reaching out to Him. So in this place today, if you've been thinking that you have, you've been doing pretty good because you're saved and you go to church and you, you quit all your sinning and you've been looking down at your neighbor, I, I want you to get off that high horse Amen. and recognize that it was God come looking for you, Amen. not you going and finding God. You ain't done nothing. You're just like Mephibosheth said about himself, nothing but an old dead dog. Your righteousness is in the sight of God is filthy rags. You're exactly right. There's nothing you have to offer him. And he come looking for you because he loves you with great love and he wants to keep his promise. He's saying our promise is a promise. Number two, the kindness that God shows us, just like the kindness that David showed to Mephibosheth, is in consideration of somebody else. It's based on a promise made to someone else. Did you know this? I don't know if you know it or not. The kindness that you're shown, the love and the mercy that comes to you that brings you into the family of God and gets you saved or born again is not because just because he loves you so much. It's because he's made a covenant and a promise with his son Jesus Christ so that all that come into him can be born again. That's the promise that's made. It was, uh, the, the Bible tells us in this chapter we just read that the kindness that David showed to Mephibosheth was for Jonathan's sake. Right? I think it was verse number 1 and verse number 3. It's for the Jonathan's sake. Uh, so Christ is not the cause of God's kindness uh, toward us, but he is the conduit. And in Ephesians chapter 4, it says, Be ye kind one to another, listen to this, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Who? Yeah. Oh, he's forgiven me. Why? For Christ's sake. Because there's a covenant between the Father and the Son. There's a promise, and a promise is a promise. And the Father told the Son, if you go and make the sacrifice, I'll forgive everyone that will receive that sacrifice. Yeah. Bless the Lord. He said, made a promise. So for Christ's sake, for the sake of the promise God made to the Son, He shows kindness unto us. Doesn't that make you want to just take off and run a few? I mean, uh, some of Mephibosheth is receiving kindness, not based on the fact that he needs kindness, which he does, or deserves it, which he may do. Uh, but, but the issue is he's getting kindness because of something that happened before Mephibosheth was ever known or thought about. Back when his daddy had a relationship with the king before he became king, that promise... It's everlasting and it's binding. And David said, I will not forget my promise. And God says, I will not forget my promise. I will show kindness unto those who come and receive the sacrifice for the sake of my son Jesus Christ. Number three, the results of this kindness are illustrative of who God is. We, when we look at the, the story of David and Mephibosheth, um, I want you to notice what happened. David inquired. In, in verse 1 in, in chapter 9, his, David said, is there any left of the house of Saul? I, I, anybody. It didn't have to be Mephibosheth. It could have been a, a, a woman. It, it could have been anybody. It could have been five of them. It could have been one. Is there anybody? He seeks after. So he calls. They said, well, we, we got a servant here. Ziba was in the house of Saul. Maybe he knows something. Bring him in. He, he, he researches and he investigates and he reaches out. He inquires, is there any that I can show kindness to? I believe the Holy Spirit does that. I believe the Holy Spirit comes in and moves and says, is there any today that I can show kindness of God to? 
let me, let me get back to my message here. He, he, was, he was found out. He was researched. Remember whenever Ziba come in and says, yeah, there's a guy, he's crippled on his feet, and he's living in Lodabar. The king sent immediately. The words they use in the King James is he went to fetch him. Everybody here understands what a fetch is. Went to fetch him. If you ever watch the Beverly Hillbillies, <laughs> Ellie Mae would sometimes go fetch Jethro. She brought him back in across her shoulder, remember? That's fetching. He fetched Mephibosheth. I believe he fetched me, amen? I believe God fetched me one day. Look, look in Luke chapter 19, it says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Christ came to, see, to seek and to save. The apostles, his disciples, who carried, who began to start the ministry of the church, uh, they went out. They were told to go into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in. They're going out seeking for those who had received the kindness of God. God's love searches out those who will come in. It's not people that's looking for God's forgiveness. It's God looking to give forgiveness to those who will receive it. With, without that type of ministry, without the Holy Spirit uh, being the one to initiate the contact with men, you would never turn to God. That's right. That's right. That's hey, listen to me. Thank God for the day that he convicted your never dying soul yeah, that's the Lord. and brought you underneath conviction, brought you here to the, to the foot of the cross so that you could find. God's love reaches out. It searches out. Uh, his providence, conscience, the gospel. Uh, every believer, every gospel believer are all his messengers. Every one of us are. Our job is to take and to reach out and to seek out those who will receive the love. Listen, not everybody's going to get saved. But don't let that be our fault. Right? Right? Let's reach out and find who it is that we can extend the mercy and the love and the grace of God to. Who is it that we can show God's kindness to? That's what David said. Is there anybody I can show God, uh, the kindness of the Lord to? And they said, well, there's a crippled boy. Bring him. Go get him. Fetch him. Is there anybody in your family that we can show the kindness? Is there anybody that lives in your neighborhood that we can show the kindness of, of the Lord? Is there anybody you know, you work with, anybody you love? And it's, is there anybody that we can show the kindness of God to? We need to fetch them. We need to fetch them. Almost done. Number four. What this did, a promise is a promise. What this showing of kindness did. It restored Mephibosheth to a position of his inheritance. His grandfather was king, but that dynasty perished. There's a new line of kings now. It's going to come through David's descendants. So everything that was with Saul kind of perished but now it's been restored by the grace and the mercy and the goodness of the new king. It, it, God's love restores us to all the possessions that we lost in the fall, in the fall of Adam, in the, in the sinful nature that we in. God's love restores us. It brings us back to a relationship, a one-on-one -on -one fellowship with the Holy God. Remember what happened in the garden? The Bible says that in the evening, God would come and walk with Adam in the cool of the day. They had fellowship. That was lost when Adam sinned. But when Jesus came, and restored us by His goodness and His grace for His own namesake, we are now restored to fellowship. Listen, every single day, it may be early in the morning, it may be late at night, you have the great pleasure of having the Spirit and the presence of God come walk with you through the garden. Amen? Thank you, Lord. P 
pass, pass by with you to talk about the things of today and what, how things are going to go or maybe how they went today. God's love restores us to our own lost possessions. Salvation is kind of like paradise regained, if you will. It, 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 it exalts um, to distinguished honors. Uh, it, it, it says of Mephibosheth, it says that Mephibosheth is going to eat at my table, at the king's table, continually. That's what David said about Mephibosheth. I want Ziba, I want you and all of your children and all of your servants. We're talking 30-something, maybe 40 people that are serving Mephibosheth and making sure that all of his business is cared for, his land, his, his crops, his house, everything is handled. But as for Mephibosheth, he's going to sit at my table every time there's a meal as if he is one of the king's sons. I believe I saw that in verse 9, 11. Verse 11, as one of the king's sons. He's going to sit at my table. Now what this does, it restores him back to the distinguished honor. Can you imagine what people must have thought in the kingdom? Who's that guy? Is that that guy that, that, that we knew was in hiding down in Lodabar uh, with, with that compassionate rich guy because he was afraid of, uh, that the king was going to wipe him out too? Is that that same crippled boy that, that they said never would amount to any? Is that that... Is that that same old cripple boy that said, we don't know why they didn't just go ahead and kill him whenever he was found to be crippled because he's not worth it? Is that that same one that now sits at the king's table as one of the king's <laughs> sons and partakes of the blessings of the king? Ah, yes, it is. Amen. Yes, and as I heard, yes, I am. Hey, he said, thou shalt eat bread at my table. How long? Continually. This is an everlasting covenant. I got to wrap up. I'm already running over. Listen, this is what Jesus said to us. Brother Garney, if you'll come, Brother Rick. Uh, this is what Jesus said to us. In Revelation chapter 3, he said this. He said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. I'll put him to my table. I'll bring him in and make him like one of the king's sons. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. Behold, I'm, I'm seeking after who I may show the kindness of God to. And if anybody will open up, I will come in and I will make a place at the table for you so that where I am, you can be also. When I sup, you will sup. The restored inheritance that sin has stole away can be given back to you again because of the goodness of a holy God and a promise is a promise and he keeps his promise last point I want to make as they get the song ready listen to this I think it was in uh, verse number um, number 12 you see that it said Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah, or Micah, maybe. And Micah, I looked it up, means, who is like God? And I thought about, I thought about Mephibosheth naming his son, who is like God? And what went through my mind was this. There had to be a day whenever that boy was when, when, when mama was pregnant or whenever he was being born, that Mephibosheth said, I can't even imagine that I should be married and have a child, and yet I've got a child. And God's blessings are overwhelming to me, and I can't imagine how I could be blessed more than I am today because I have a young son. I've got a, I've got a child who is like God, who is like unto our Lord, who is so gracious and kind as he is. So he names him Micah or Micah. And little did he know that by giving praise for what God had blessed him with, that he was about to be opened up to even greater blessings than he could imagine. This is where I want to close this morning. I want to ask you, 
How's, you, how's your living been going? We oftentimes get bogged down in what's going on and we complain about what's happening in our lives. Maybe you've had some things that have crippled you, caused you to feel like you're nothing more than a dead dog. Nobody cares about you and you're in obscurity. You're the only one left and nobody really cares about you either. And you kind of just feel that way and you just kind of sulk down in it. Well, this is what Mephibosheth did. Mephibosheth gave praise to God for what blessing he had. And when his wife had a child, she said, he said, who is like God? Who is like God? I couldn't ask for any more. And then just a little while later, there's a knock at the door. And Ellie Mae scoops him up. Because she was sent to fetch him. And he's taken to the king's presence. And he must be thinking, this is it. It's finally happening. And as he's laying on his face before the king, the king says, Mephibosheth, thy servant is here, O Lord. Mephibosheth, don't be afraid. I've brought you here because I want to restore everything back to you. That's been taken away from you, son. I want to show you kindness for your father Jonathan's sake. I loved your father. We had a covenant and a promise, and a promise is a promise. And here's my close. Would you stand with me? God made a promise with his son Jesus that whosoever will may be saved. That promise is through the covenant with the father and the son. But today, you're here and you're able to receive it because of the in, inherent promise that was made. You can get the kindness and the goodness on the basis of somebody else. Jesus didn't do it because he had to. He did it because of you and me. He died for you and me. This is what would happen. It would be a real shame for you to kick dirt in the face of that great offering and walk out of here lost and undone. Or maybe today you have been saved, but you haven't been walking in appreciation of the great goodness that God has brought in your life. And I want you to recognize that today it's because of the covenant, the promise that was made with the Son. And maybe today you need to repent and ask God to forgive you for your unthankful attitude. Today would be the day. Let me pray. Father, This is the most important time that I can think of that any man, woman, boy, or girl will come to. It's the time when the Holy Spirit has spoken to somebody, maybe everyone, but has spoken to someone, drawing them, calling them, and, 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 and inviting them to come. And Lord, today they, the question will be, will they respond? Will they be fetched today? And will they receive the kindness of God? Lord, I ask God that you'd help every heart to be open and willing to step out and respond to your call in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Rick, would you come? To Jesus, I'd love to have you right up here if you would. Maybe God spoke to you and said, hey, Brother Buddy, I haven't been walking right. I haven't been doing things right. Would you come? He won't break it. It don't matter who you are or what you've done, how crippled you may think you are, He will bring you in, set you at the king's table continually. Are you ready to receive what is yours and has been stolen away or been restored back to you by the goodness of an almighty God? Last verse right here.
been doing this, but I'm going to greet you as you go out. I'm going to have my mask on. And um, as you go out today, I, I just want to be able to, I can't shake your hand, but I can tell you it's glad to have you in the house of the Lord. So uh, if you don't understand that, it's because I'm doing two cousins. So I'm putting that on. Um, thank you for being here. God bless you. Um, and continue to pray that God would lead us and guide us as we continue to open up more and more well, as we believe God's leading us to do. I pray that we come through this, like I said earlier, stronger than we came into it. Fathers, I bow before you. I want to ask your blessings upon our dismissal. Help us, Lord, to walk according to your ways. Bless our government and our leaders and our, our um, law enforcement. I pray God should be with them as they deal with them. Um, uh, just, uh, I believe, very satanic spirits that are in, in force around in, in our communities. And I pray God should lay your hands upon uh, them and give them safety and guidance. I pray to Heavenly Father now for our worship services uh, that are to come this evening, Lord, once again, that the Word of God would touch the heart of someone that needs to know you as personal Savior. We thank you once again for the privilege of being able to worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Pastor Buddy here. Thank you for joining us today for our worship service. It is my prayer that you have heard from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ through something that was sung or preached or said. If God has touched you, then I would urge you that you surrender to him today without delay. If you've made a decision to trust Christ as your personal Savior, or maybe you have chosen to surrender to him more fully in his Lordship, then I would urge you to let us know by giving us a call at 904-924-8240 or you can email me at 